So in Hawaii, and actually many parts of the world, he, he literally needs no introduction because his ukulele school and his artistry, they are known around the world. But you may not have known that he is a warm-hearted disciple of Jesus Christ, and he is an overcomer. Would you give a warm You Hope welcome to Roy Sakuba, Brother Roy, come on up. <laughs> All right, brother. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. When, when uh, Pastor Mike asked me to share, um, you know, I, I just have, have learned through my stories and everything that I do is never to say no if I feel that something I might say may help someone. And so this is why I go to schools and any organization that calls me, whether it's senior citizens or anyone, I will go. And I, I never carry notes with me because I try to let the words come out from my heart. I mean, I really pray that whatever I say here today is coming from the love in my heart. Yes. And But to tell you how it all started, uh, as I listened to uh, over, over, overcomers, uh, my life was full of pain. Uh, so briefly, I'm just going to share with you what I went through. And it started off when I was born. I was born with a birth defect. Um, I don't know how I got into music and how I became this uh, ukulele teacher, but I'm practically deaf in one ear because my ear is so small. Do you see this side, how small it is? Whereas this side, the ear is a normal size. And ever since I was very small, the kids in the neighborhood, and even when I started going to kindergarten, would say, oh, what's wrong with your ear? How come your ear is so ugly? How come you're ugly? And I would go home crying to my mother, but my mother um, is mentally ill. She, she was diagnosed later as a severe paranoid schizophrenia. And my mother used to tell me that Buddha made you like this, that everybody, they're looking at you, they're looking at us, look, look outside, they're all looking at you. And I'm just a little boy, four or five years old, and I start believing in this. I start believing that, oh, why am I here? Why am I born? How come everybody's normal except me? And I started cutting out of school from kindergarten because the pain was so great when I, I started developing paranoia. So people can be, girls can be talking about their hair and I'd walk out of school because I think the next thing they're gonna do is they're gonna talk about my ear. So I started cutting out of school in kindergarten. My father, who was a good man, used to give me the belt and, and you know, but I didn't care. I would take the lickings, I would take the crying, the beating any day over going to school. That was more painful. So to kind of get rid of that pain or help me, I started smoking. I started smoking. I learned how to, um, through Bull, Bull Durham, how to fold my own cigarettes and start smoking from our first cigarette was six years old. And by seven, I was smoking a cigarette every day. And I, this was my life. I cut out of school first grade, second grade, third grade. And it just got worse and worse. And I started drinking alcohol with the other older kids twice my age. I would tell them, I want a beer. And I would drink. And my icebox is empty. All we had throughout all my years living at home was hot dog, ice water, eggs, and bacon in our icebox. There's nothing else in our icebox. So all the way until I got to around 16, I never ate vegetables or I never ate fruits. All I ate was a hot dog and egg. So that's why I would stay in school to eat lunch. And then I'd walk out of the school and just cut out. Uh, I don't know how they passed me every year, but they kept on passing me. <laughs> And, and it got worse. And, and finally, what happened that really started my downfall is that my brother, who was eight years older than me, developed the same paranoid schizophrenia. But he snapped. It all came just one time. And we were, I never forgot this. We were at the uh, kitchen table trying to eat my egg or whatever it was. And he came at me with the large kitchen knife. And he said, I'm killing you now. And I slid between the ice box and the table, and he couldn't, he lunged, but he missed me. And I ran out of that house because in those days, you don't lock the door. The door is wide open, so I just bust out crying. And then I could hear my mother yelling and screaming, and my brother just ranting and, you know, throwing things around the house. I went behind and grabbed where I knew my father kept a sword, and I decided I'm going to kill my brother. But I was only like, 10 years old when my brother was 18. So the neighborhood kids, the older kids, grabbed me and wouldn't let me go in the house with the sword. Instead, the police came and took him away in a straitjacket to Kanoe Mental Hospital. But within two months, they let him out back into our house. And my father, 
said, don't worry. He's on, he's on medication. He's not going to hurt you. But I can try and go to sleep, and I see that knife coming at me, and it scared me so much. I would leave the house to 2 o'clock in the morning until I knew he was sleeping before I would walk back in that house because I was so scared he was going to kill me. My problem is my mother wakes me up at 4 o'clock to eat breakfast. She's mentally ill. So my whole life was distorted. I mean, I was just totally out of sync with what life was. And, and it hurt. It, I mean, I was in so much pain and paranoia. I started to try to do things to take my life. I didn't want to live. And one of the things that I remember so vividly is that growing up, I did this every day. I hate you, God. I hate you, God. I hate you, God. I would do that all the time because I hated God so much because I thought God had something to do with my life. And I, I grew up hating God. But then he, as time went on, I realized, and I'll bring this up now, I realized I did not hate God. I hated myself. I hated myself so much. I didn't care if I died. I, I used to tell God, why did you put me on Mars? Why couldn't I live on Mars by myself? You know, this is my life. But my life got worse because after my brother had this mental breakdown, my best friend, I had two best friends, one of them came down with the same mental illness. And one day, the mother calls me on the phone and says, Owen's not coming. And I says, what do you mean? Every single morning, he comes over my house. Oh, Roy, come outside, let's play. But he didn't come this morning. And the mother told me on the phone, we had to take him to the hospital. He had a mental breakdown. I, I cried, I was just brokenhearted. How can I lose my mother, now my brother, and now my best friend to mental illness? Well, the, the one thing is I had an older boy, three years older than me, who took care of me. Anytime the kids in the neighborhood would try to tease me or something, he would tell the kid, hey, leave Roy alone. Don't you dare touch him. So he was like my big brother. He, you know, he was a really dear friend who really cared for me. One day, he gave me a bottle of drugs, and he says, Roy, can you hold these drugs for me? And I said, sure. That very, very same night, his best friend shot him in the head. He was 16, I was that, and this time I was 13, and I lost him. So what happened is I got into trouble. The, the police arrested me, took me to detention home where I spent a little time. And then I stayed on probation for two years. I was on probation for two years, and my life just kept on spiraling down. I says, you know, nothing else can go wrong. What else can go wrong? Then my neighbor right next door to me, one day, I hear the mother screaming and yelling, no, 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 what is happening? And this boy who's two years older than me, now up this, this is when I was 14, he was 16, he hung himself in the closet. So I thought I was evil. I thought there was something about me that was evil. And I said, I don't belong here. And that's why I tried to take my life several times. But for some reason, it, you know, I, I survived. What? Well, as after all this happened, it got worse. Now I'm older, I was probably about 17 years old. Uh, the FBI came over to my house and they said, uh, they told my father, we need to talk to your son. So I went outside to talk to the FBI and then when I went back in, my father asked me, why was the FBI here? And it's something that I've never spoken about. But I told my father the truth, and it broke my father's heart. He said, from this day forward, you are no longer my son. I disowned you. You are not my son. And, and it really crushed me. I mean, I, I was crushed now. I was crushed. I mean, I, I just didn't want to go on with life already. And, and this was something that really was terrible that happened in Hawaii. The thing is, I'm innocent, but I knew the people. And the people who are almost twice my age protected me by never telling me what they were doing or what they were planning to do. Because they kind of liked me. And I was like the little kid that, that uh, was, was always so good to them. But it, it, it scarred me a lot because now I lost my father. And you know, so this is how I went through my young life. 
I, I, I never said the word love because I didn't understand what love was. And sometimes my friends would say, hey, I love this girl. But I couldn't say that word until one day, I was in my young 20s, a friend of mine says, Roy, I want, to meet, I want you to meet this girl. I said, oh, no, I don't want to meet her. You know, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be so nervous. They said, oh, come on. You just got to meet her for lunch. <laughs> well, eventually, I had the nerve to ask her out on a date. And we started dating maybe once every two weeks. And after dating for a period of time, I, I started to feel, could, could this really be love? Could this be love? And finally, after dating her off and on for 18 months, I finally said, this has to be love. I'm going to ask her to marry me because I felt I loved her. So we, we went out and I said, I love you. Will you marry me? And when she said yes, I was so happy. I mean, for the first time in my life, I was so happy. I went home that night and for the first time I laid in bed and I was happy because I always went to bed sad. I always went to bed sad, but I was happy. And the next morning, I woke up and I started crying. I knew I had to let her go. I knew I had to tell her, you're not going to marry me, and I want you to walk away from me. So I, I asked her, let's go out. And we went out, and I said, would you just please let's listen to me? And she said, yes. And then I started to tell her. I started to tell her everything about my life, how I couldn't look in the mirror to comb my hair because I don't want to see my face. So I hide my face when I comb my hair. I told her that you cannot touch me. If you notice, every time you touch me, I pull away from you. And then I can touch you. Then it's OK for you to touch me. But nobody in my life could touch me. As soon as they touched me, I would make some kind of excuse to pull away from them because I was so afraid that when you touch me, you're going to see all the stuff in me, all the junk in me. So it was my way of protecting myself. And I started telling her that I told her that I, I have a hard time taking a shower in my own shower by myself. Why? Because when I was about eight years old, my best friend and I, we had our clothes taken off on the main street. P. Koi Street was the main street way back then. And they held us naked from the waist down as the cars passed. And they made fun of our bodies. And because I was paranoid about my ear, now I came paranoid about my body. And so I would never play PE in school. I would just cut out of school because I felt I was such a, well, you know, I mean, I just hated myself. I hated everything about me. And I'm telling her this. I'm, I'm telling her this, I'm telling her everything I do with you is a fake. That when I smile with you and I laugh with you and I joke with your friends, it's a fake. I'm, it took me almost three dates to tell her everything. Because I loved her so much, I wanted her to walk away from me because I truly felt her happiness was more important. That would make me happy to see her marry someone that could make her happy. I didn't care. I didn't care about me. I just wanted her to be happy. So I told her all the things. I shared everything in my body. I, I searched for things. I told her shame, pride. I told her my fears. I told her everything about me that I didn't like. And when I finished telling her everything, I told her, please find someone that can make you happy. I wish you the very best. And she looked at me, and for the first time, she, she told me these words, which I have never forgotten. She said, I never saw it as your weaknesses. I see it as your strengths. She didn't want to leave me. After all of these things I told her, she said, let's make it work together. And you know, next month, October 24th, I just noticed that they may have showed a picture of her. You know, we celebrate our 42nd uh, wedding anniversary. And she's going to be here tomorrow morning. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's her. You know, and, and she actually, those words brought me healing. And this is something, I'm going to share what happened to me after that. It started about, well, I didn't realize it. But when I had shared everything about her, um, about myself, 
I started to heal from the inside. Wow. All the things that was bothering me started to leave. It just started to leave. And the things that I was so afraid of, uh, taking off my clothes, uh, looking at my ear, uh, all these, because I used to have long hair to hide my ear. I cut my hair shorter and shorter now because it doesn't bother me anymore. And practically everything that I told her about my fears left. It just left over the years. And then love started to enter. It just kept on entering until it almost like it filled me up with love. And so when I teach my students at school, when I go to schools and speak to kids, when I go to the Ko'ola Boys and Girls Home and speak to the kids, when I go to the detention home, when I speak to the military, it's, I wait until I feel this love for everybody. And then I start speaking, and then I can just feel the words start coming out. It's just, and there's this love that just happens. And I, and I realize now that um, I, uh, there are so many things I shared with uh, 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 the pastor and Mona. Uh, we had a long meeting, and I started sharing all of these things that the Lord would speak. I didn't know the Lord was speaking to me, but all these things would enter me, and I would speak it in schools. And it would bring healing to the kids. I have hundreds in the thousand of letters from kids who wrote, I was going to commit suicide, but you came to our school and spoke to us, and you saved me. Kids talk, right, that you, you took the hated parts out of me and put the good parts in me. And I know it's not me. I, I know, I do pray and I do believe that the Lord is using me as a vessel to speak words of healing to others. So I never take credit for it. I mean, I do believe that the Lord is guiding me. And one day I was speaking to a pastor and I said, reveal is to heal. And then, then the pastor said, yes, reveal is to heal. And then I said something that, and this is where the Lord brings these things into my, into me. I, I said, heal, H-E-A-L, healing enters amazing love. And then he looked at me, he kind of stopped, and I looked at him and I said, H-E-A-L, healing enters amazing love. And that's what happened. So when I let everything out, then the Lord now could fill me with love. And the amazing love is the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Holy Spirit. Amen. And this is the message I try to help people understand because, you know, as long as we hide our fears, as long as we hide shame, this is my personal feeling that we block the love that wants to come to us many times mm -hmm. because it's like a barrier. Mm -hmm. It's like a barrier. And you might think, well, I don't want to talk about these things that I never talked about because, you know, that's your secrets. But I believe our secrets creates an invisible barrier. It creates an invisible barrier. And, and so many people who come up to me and say, you know, Roy, I can just come up to you and hug you because I'm not intimidated. I, I just feel that I can just hold you. And, and I believe in my vulnerability that we actually bring people closer to us. But when we, when we hide things about ourselves, there's an invisible barrier. And you know, I was sharing with the pastor and with Moda that every night, I mean, I used to get, my stomach used to get so warm, heated at night when I pray to the Lord, you know, I'm lying down and I'm praying. I actually went to a doctor, even if a pastor told me, Roy, that's the Holy Spirit. I said, no, no. And I went to the doctor to get that thing going to my stomach to check me out. He said, nothing's wrong. But I'm, I'm being just very honest that when I pray at night and I lift my hands up and I pray, dear Lord, to fill me with the Holy Spirit, I do feel that warmth come to me. And it's, it's such a beautiful feeling. But... What I'm trying to say is with this Holy Spirit, if it is in me, if, it's, if that's what it is, I always tell the Lord, it is not for me to keep. Let me give this love to everybody else because it's not for me. And I, I don't believe this is what it is. I, I hope this message resonates a bell. And I, I can share this because uh, the pastor was talking some of these things. I have never heard another person, despite all the struggles I went through, I cannot remember. And one of the things is, 
when I was young and my friends used to make fun of other people and tease people and I would never say a single word because I was afraid if I say something about that person and that person finds out, they're going to hurt me. So to keep it, so to protect myself, I never spoke about another person. And that's how I grew up. And uh, my wife once told me, we were talking and I was talking about the DOE and she told me, Stop it. Stop talking about the DOE. And I was complaining because uh, every year they change the thing on school teachers and I talked to so many school teachers. She told me, I have never heard you say a word. I, I have never heard you judge another person. Don't start now. And I walked away from that. I sat down and I thanked the Lord that if I have nothing nice to say, I will not say it. Because this is what I tell kids. If if you hurt someone, you have just given everybody the right to hurt you. If you judge someone, you have given everybody the right to judge you. And I, I live my life that way. So I always tell my employees, I will not lie. I will not judge. And I will love you. And that's what I try to live each and every day of my life. So I end with this, and I just wanted to share with you that um, you're all very special to me. and. I just wanted to thank you for giving me this opportunity to share a little bit about my life. And if I may share one last thing. Yeah, absolutely. When I was a groundskeeper for the city and county, after one year, I got hired to be the supervisor. I turned the job down because I'm only 21. Everybody's 45, 50. They said, too bad. August, you're the supervisor. Everybody turned against me, and they started talking behind my back, mean things about me. At lunch, nobody sits with me. Everybody sits down there, and they leave me by myself. This is what I did. I, I said, if these people are talking behind my back, I want them to say it to my face. And I grabbed my lunch, and I sat with them, and I waited for them to blast me. Not one person said anything hurtful to me. I was 21, and I walked away from that lunch, learning one of the greatest lessons of my life that when people judge you, when people hurt you, when people say hurtful things about you or to your face, it is not meant for you. It is coming from a hurtful place from the person speaking right. those words. That's right. and, and that's the message I wanna share. And last thing, isn't it interesting that the people we hurt the most are usually the people that are closest to us? And it's because we got away with it once, we got away with it twice, we can do it again. I'm going to end with this thing that the Lord gave me in 1970 that um, helped me understand who I am. Right, let me... Let me... And... I never, never, never sing. I only play my ukulele eight hours a day because it really helped bring me healing. Because when I'm playing my ukulele, I cannot think about the pain in my life. That's why I practice eight, 10 hours a day. And I believe that's what the Lord gave me to keep me from struggling so much in life. But one day, I just picked up my ukulele and in my deepest pain, I just started singing for the first time in my life. And this is what came out of my... <clears throat> I am what I am. I'll be what I'll be. Look, can't you see that it's me, all of me? I am what I am. I'll be what I'll be. Look, can't you see that it's me? And I believe those words mean that every single child, every one of us is special, but we get hurt. And it's when we get hurt is that's when we start changing who we are because the pain becomes a part of our life. And we should really find a moment now where we can share with someone that loves us and reveal everything that we've kept secret because it's in revealing that we now can have inner healing and to bring the love of our Lord Jesus Christ more and more into our heart. I love you all. Thank you. Amen. Amen.
Roy. <laughs> Thank that was you. so beautiful. Thank you, Roy. Roy Sakuma. Thank you.